to England and we have a missionary, a Latter-day Saint missionary getting kidnapped and held and had things done to him for several days. This case has it all. I am telling you, it is wild. Stuff that began in my old stomping grounds where I grew up in Utah County, Utah, Provo. And then it hopped all over the country and then jutted across the Atlantic. And just when you think the story is over, it's not. We're talking FBI investigations. This is the story of Joyce McKinney and the case of, quote, the Manacled Mormon. You want to stick around for this one. Welcome to True Crime, Faith, and Chocolate. I am your host, Annette Lyon, USA Today bestselling author of the suspense novel Just One More and a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm also a true crime junkie, woman of faith, member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is the faith so far of all of my cases that I've covered, but not forever. And I'm also, of course, chocoholic and all that fun stuff. This video has been a long time in the making. I swear, not only were there just research rabbit holes I kept falling down and finding new information, but then technology was just not my friend. I would have a mic suddenly just die in the middle of recording, didn't know it had happened till it was done, and other bizarre things like that. So let's just hope the gremlins are happy and leave me alone today. Joyce McKinney, who... Uh, joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints while she was in college. Now, she grew up in North Carolina, very much a Southern belle, has a Southern accent to go with it. Got a degree, I believe, in North Carolina, and then she, that was her bachelor's. She then went to Tennessee and got a master's. I don't know what those two degrees were in. Uh, she's talked about how many acting classes she's had, so I imagine it was something theater, drama, something, speech, something along those lines. She was a little pageant girl growing up. I don't think she began like the toddlers and tiara type age, but she definitely did a, a bunch in her like early teen years and did never won. And that will become a problem as we move forward because she was constantly trying to get that attention and just being in a pageant or even being a finalist was never good enough for Joyce. While she's in Tennessee, she apparently is boarding with a Latter-day Saint family, and she gets close to them and decides to join the church. Knowing what we know about her later, um, she is very self-centered and wants the attention, very narcissistic. I don't, I doubt she ever believed anything about it. Now, I'll put all of my or the bulk anyway, of I did so much research. But the bulk of my resource, I'll put the, the list into the show notes. But I'll be referring a lot to two particular sources. The documentary based on her and this whole situation called Tabloid came out in 2010. Keep that data in mind because the story's not over after that. And then the other one was a book by the name of Joyce McKinney in the case of the Manacled Mormon by Anthony, and I'm not sure how you say his last name, if it's Delano or Delano. He's a British author. So I'm going to call him Anthony. Or maybe Anthony is probably how he pronounces it in England. So I will not, I'll, I don't know. I'll just, he's Anthony. We'll, we'll go with that. The problem with his book, and as fascinating as it was, and as thorough in some ways as it was, is that he did enough research to then not know what he didn't know. And so I have to take things with a grain of salt because he, like, if you read it, just ignore chapter six and seven entirely. He tries to go into the founding of the church and some of the beliefs of the church, and he gets some things right, and then just completely other things absolutely fast backwards wrong. Like, where did that even come from? Like, and it, it, he even gets things wrong, like basic geography within the state. Like, did you look at a map? At one point, he talks about how Ogden is the other city that borders the Great Salt Lake. And it, I'll post a map here. It Ogden does not border the, the Great Salt Lake. It, it literally does not. So there's weird things like that. And he'll talk about various things like, oh, there was this store that was on Center Street in Provo. And I know that in the 70s, Provo Center Street was very run down. And there was not that type of a... a 
business there that probably would have been in Orem at the new mall there, then called University Mall, today called University Place. Um, even something as simple as, like, saying that uh, we don't believe that Christ's atonement was necessary. That is, like, core belief number one. I don't know where he got the idea that we don't believe that Christ's atonement was necessary. That no, that that's that's literally the bottom, most core belief we have. So he goes off about other weird things, and um, so because of that, I have to wonder what else is wrong in other parts that don't necessarily reflect my faith, religion, culture, location. So I try I've tried to rely on things that he quotes, so court transcripts and that kind of thing. That I figure if he's quoting it from a record, chances are that is accurate. So I I'm hesitant on some of his claims, but it's hard for me to know the the documentary of called Tabloid. There is a lot in there where you see actual people from the situations being interviewed, and when what they say in the documentary corresponds with his book, then I figure that is probably accurate. This is the best I can do and hope, and I think I am going to also be adding some insight that someone not, again, of my faith and culture would understand about this case. The Bay people are just glossing over because they don't know. Also, some interesting uh, people involved, one in particular, that uh, blew my mind when I kind of went down that rabbit hole that I have not seen anyone else bring up, so... We'll talk about it. Here we go. In the documentary tabloid, <laughs> they spent a lot of time with her. I was actually uh, impressed that they gave her so much screen time. And uh, she made herself not look too terribly great. When she joined this cult, as she calls us, uh, two things she said is, they, they made me think that they were a church. And... They made me think they were family oriented. <laughs> now, whatever your criticisms about my faith, I don't think anyone can say objectively that we are not family oriented. In fact, we tend to be so family oriented that many people say we worship the family. We used to have really large families and stay at home moms were the norm. And we are very family focused, guys. That's like, even if you think we're a cult, where there's millions and millions of us, more outside the U.S. than inside the U.S. Today, I don't see how you could not call us a church. So even our critics, come on. She goes on about other things, supposedly, that she wasn't told that we believe, which are some I can see where she got the, the little kernel, and then she kind of went off, kind of like Chad and Lori do their own little scary things, but she is just bizarre on some things. Like... They didn't tell me that they said that they believe that Jesus was a polygamist. No, we don't. No, we don't. We're, no. There could be someone, some member, speculating, giving his opinion, but you will never find that in any speech, sermon, scripture, anything. That, no, that's not a thing. Also, that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. Again, not part of the doctrine. I think some of some members think maybe he might have been, kind of like Da Vinci Code Dan Brown made that guess, but it's absolutely not part of our doctrine or official beliefs at all. Then she says that that we believe that we that Mormons will each in the next life be awarded our own planet. No, we do not. Um, what I think she's misunderstanding is that or exalted could become like gods. Antony thinks also that only men get exalted. Actually, men and women cannot be exalted without each other. It's like, the way I put it, it's like a yin and yang. You have to be together and married to be exalted. That's the belief, and so you're exalted together. So Antony's wrong on that, but also, um, not that you get your own planet, but that you could then become gods and goddesses and have your own spirit children and create planets for them. So I see where she got the idea from, but no, that's, that's a distorted way of looking at it. Supposedly, again, I don't know where she got this from, but no, that we believe that God lives on a star called Kolob. So Kolob shows up in one 
chapter of our scripture in just a couple of verses, and it is described as the name of the star closest to God's throne. Does that make sense? So it's not, it's not, God doesn't live on a star. God it does not live on Kolob. It's, it's the name of a star near God. And that's literally something that comes up every couple of years. And when someone, there's actually a hymn using the term Kolob. And that, that's the most often I ever hear the term because it's just not something we really talk about. It's not really that big of a thing. Now, the biggest one that was kind of like sort of, she's sort of right, but still wrong, was that uh, Latter-day Saints believe that the... the Black people had the curse of Cain upon them. This was night early mid seventies. The big part of the case was seventy seven to seventy eight, and at that time there were members who believed that. There were some leaders who taught that, and then June of nineteen seventy eight, the policy that restricted uh, full priesthood blessings and all of that to um, African American, those of African American descent, was that was removed, taken away, and now it's all equal. And Anthony actually says in his book, and his book was written well after all of the events that took place. And the book version I read was actually a follow-up. So he should have fixed this. Um, he says that even today that uh, African-American Latter-day Saints cannot have full fellowship and membership, which is absolute load of crap. We have plenty of members in of African descent in Africa. We have general authorities who are Black. That's uh, all of that changed in June of seventy eight, and even at that point, one of the staunch leaders who used to actually say things about the supposed curse of Cain, he actually said, "Ignore things we said prior to June seventy eight. We were working with limited light and knowledge, and we didn't know what we were talking about." Essentially, so and those were excuses people were trying to make to explain the ban, which I personally explain as Brigham Young was a racist. God allowed his policies to continue because he's working with imperfect people. Um, but it wasn't a policy of God. That is my opinion. Because we do know that Joseph Smith actually did ordain some black men to the priesthood. So it didn't come with Joseph. Anyway, the little thing saying, oh, Mormonism is so dangerous and, and evil, which is just so hilarious. Anyway, while she's living with this Latter-day Saint family and converts, while she's in Tennessee, she decides to get a doctorate in film at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. She applies. She gets a scholarship. Yay! So she comes to Provo and goes to school. She is 25 at this point, getting her doctorate. And she is teaching classes in drama and speech. Now, uh, interestingly enough... That would have been in the Harris Fine Arts Center building, which I spent a lot of time in back in my days at BYU. Uh, they recently tore it down because they're building some new buildings, and it's them which makes me kind of sad. I would have loved to show you the old, um, they call it HVAC, Harris Fine Arts Center, you know, the uh, abbreviation there for the VAC, an acronym. She lives at an apartment complex called the Riviera, which is still there. Apparently, at the time, I haven't fact-checked this, but this seems plausible from what I have read, that the Riviera was owned by the Osmond family at the time. Now, the Osmonds, this was the height of their fame. They had their own studio that was very nearby in Orem. So she uh, was living at the Riviera, knew about the Osmonds, and she tried to get in with them. And the family has said, yeah, we knew who she was, and she was trying to be friends. And, and Olive, the mother, Osmond, uh, even said that, oh yeah, we, we knew her. She talked to all the boys roughly equally. Um, that, that was about it. She later claimed that she dated Wayne, one of their brothers, and uh, they deny that. They're like, no, no, she hung out with everybody equally and we don't really know her that well. Uh, but then when, we do know she kind of had a, this emotional breakdown when Wayne announced his engagement and she said so whether she in her head thought they were dating or it was just she wished they were maybe he was her first obsession didn't know after the whole wayne supposed breakup she meets another young man now she has a corvette and they uh, anthony calls it persimmon colored so orangey and she pulls in 
to this uh, ice cream shop, as it's described, on um, a main street in Provo. And then Pope pulls in. He also has a Corvette. I believe his was white. And they notice each other, like, oh, same car. And Kirk starts picking her up, or she's attracted to him, whichever. They start talking. That's where they meet. Now, those of you who know BYU and Provo, I am willing to bet that they met, especially because it was in their cars and it was like a drive-in type situation. I am betting this was Stevenette's malt shop, which was very close to the Riviera. It would have been within walking distance of the Riviera and BYU. It, and, and the Stevenette's malt shop was a big hangout because it was also close to Provo High School. And not too far from Timview High School, the two high schools in the city, it was a very big hangout for a lot of people. She talks about while she was there, she was with a friend named Marilyn Clark. And she describes Marilyn as being this wild and rebellious friend of hers and who would do all the things a perfect little good girl like her would not do. You know, drinking and smoking and whatever else. Now, what she doesn't say... But I found out in Anthony's book um, is that Marilyn was like 15. So mm, um, we're talking a 10 year age gap here. So who is influencing whom, pray tell? Uh, yeah, I, I think this is a case of projection. So, of course, projection is where you are pointing to somebody else and accusing them of something you think, feel, or do. I think it was Joyce who had the bad influence on Marilyn. And that seems to bear out because Anthony says that uh, Marilyn's father was a professor of French at BYU. I looked him up a bit. And from things I could, I could gather, he was not thrilled. <laughs> the family was not thrilled with Marilyn's relationship with Joyce. And they felt that Joyce was a bad influence on Marilyn. So that, that kind of fits. But when she meets Kirk, she says that... She was drawn to his blue eyes. So, okay, you know, we're attracted to something physical. That makes sense. And then she says, it's clean skin. That, that's what I've never heard someone say that they were attracted to someone because they had the cleanest skin. But that's what Joyce says. Keep it in mind, though, because that may comes into play later. So other people have said that Kirk wasn't like this classically attractive man. He was very tall, for one, uh, and he was a little on the heavier side, kind of had a shuffling gait. And so some people said he actually was unattractive. Pictures I've seen, he just seems quite average, just like a, a, a nice boy. You know, he was 19. So keep that in mind again, 19 versus her 25. So when we start getting to things of who did what to whom and who influenced whom when he grew up in Provo or I'm very sheltered and suddenly this beautiful woman who had been in pageants comes calling. Mm. So, and while we're talking pageants, so while she's at BYU also, she wants to enter the Miss USA pageant and she discovers that Wyoming does not have a representative for the pageant. She has never lived in Wyoming, mind you, but she finds a way to do paperwork, whatever, and she gets appointed Miss Wyoming, and she then represents the state of Wyoming in the Miss USA pageant. Of course, she does not win, but for the rest of her life, she has been saying that she was in the Miss USA pageant. She also tried to be part of pageants in, in Utah and never won, and that, that always kind of rubbed her the wrong way. Surprise, surprise. So they talked about how Kirk at 19 was an elder. Now, that's something that needs a little clarification. Uh, there was a podcast I listened to several years ago that was about white collar crime. And there were some Latter day Saints involved just peripherally. And one was mentioned as being an elder. And the host said, Oh, that must have taken him years to read. That, that's a big deal to be an elder. No, actually. That's considered like the default that everyone assumes if you're an adult man, you're you're and you're a practicing person in the, the faith, then, then you're an elder. That, that's literally the default um, at church. When you have we have like, you know, the Sunday school that everybody attends, the adults together, and then they have classes where it'll be just the women or just the men. And the men's adult class is elders quorum. 
And if you are not ordained an elder in the priesthood, you are listed on the rolls as a prospective elder. They just that that's where the men go. That that's the default. It's literally and then if you're not an elder, the goal is to get you to become an elder. And if you're active and practicing, that's almost a given it will happen. So not a big deal. If he is at college and about to go on a mission, yeah, he would be an elder. Now, here we get into more projecting. She claims, this is very much a he said, she said situation on this part. She says that at the end of the first day they have to, when they met, he said he loved her. On the second day he proposed, on the third day they were picking out names for their children. And now I'll say in Anthony's book versus the documentary, the names she gives are completely different names. So I don't know if they actually picked out names or not. But Kirk was on the record saying that by the end of the first day, she was saying, I love you to him. And second day, she was saying we should get married. All of this was projection, in my opinion. I don't think Kirk, who was getting ready to go on a mission, would have been proposing. He probably hadn't even had a girlfriend yet. Now... After the Riviera, she moves to an apartment complex in Orem and then later ends up in northern Provo, it sounds like, in like this off little building house, mini little house thing. It sounds like, I'm not sure if it was just at the Riviera or in Orem, but she had landlords who were happy to let her break the rules because she was very uh, persuasive in explaining why she needed to do X, Y, or Z, or why whatever. Years later, she would say that in the Riviera, she had, you know, it was a drug den and there was alcohol and pictures of naked boys on the walls. And I'm thinking at the Riviera, a block away from BYU, and BYU approved student housing that's owned by the ops. No, no, like BYU is, is, is listed as the most stone cold sober university in the country for a reason. You can't find alcohol. In fact, Anthony goes off in his book about how it's really hard to find alcohol that's beyond like cans of beer in a grocery store in Provo. And yet somehow her apartment was in a den of drugs and alcohol with these posters on the wall. Like you can't have it both ways. He also, this is one of those things that doesn't make sense. He describes the complex she lived in in Orem as uh, having 40,000 residents. Which is bonkers. That's that's bigger than some towns that are nearby. BYU has a student population. I think then it was about twenty five thousand. It goes between twenty five and thirty thousand students, and there's not one apartment complex that can house all of those students. I don't know where he got forty thousand in one complex. That seems bonkers. Four hundred, I would believe, but forty thousand, like with. Four zeros? No. Anthony also talks about, this is where he's he got part of it right and part of it wrong, where that uh, to have housing be BYU standards office approved, uh, there had to be certain rules. And he said it's only for the moral re reasons that it would be approved. And so you wouldn't have boys and girls living together. True. Um, not even in the same complex. That's not true. Oftentimes, I think it would be like different buildings, maybe, but not entirely separate complexes. And that's not true. Um, BYU would expect students to not have members of the opposite sex in their bedrooms. Obvious reasons for that. Um, not just like, oh, temptation, but also for safety. He says it wasn't for our practical purposes. And that's where he's wrong. You, be BYU student approved housing, landlords are, were, are and were required to have a basic level of uh, quality living. So they had to have a certain amount of things that were furnished, a bed, a kitchen table, uh, appliances that work, and every, every tenant had to have a chair with a back and things like that, but just very basic level of furnishings just to make sure that the students aren't, are not living in squalor. So it's not just, you know, the temptations and evils of the world thing. That's part of it. So when she's living in this little house, she sets up this big, huge waterbed in the front room. And that is where she decides to deflower Kirk. She also claims that he's the one who did it to her, but then she set it up with like this fur rug and this beautiful quilt that was special to her whatever 
She says in court later, this is in England, in court, where she's describing that night, and she said a couple of things that just don't make sense back to back. So first she said, again, this is years down the road, but she says it was the most special commitment in my life that night when they supposedly both lost their virginities. She said, it made me his wife in God's eyes. To him, it was a quick thrill, something casual, something for him to cover up to his bishop and his mother. And I'm thinking, this is, again, young man who's never had a girlfriend, probably the first girl he's ever kissed, or at least had any kind of serious relationship with. This would not have been a quick thrill. This is, that's not how he grew up. It literally would not have been a casual thing. It would have been a very big deal. And yet it wasn't a quick thrill to cover up because he quickly felt guilty and confessed to his bishop because he wanted to go on a mission and that might have been, that would have stood in his way if he hadn't gone through the repentance process before his mission. So to have her say it was this casual thing to cover up doesn't wash. Uh, this is, of course, is when she's in court and had been facing uh, accusations that he was not willing when she was had kidnapped him again, which we will get to while he's on his mission and had her way with him. Uh, and he said this was assault. She said, this is not the first time he's accused me of doing that to him. I'll use, I'll add a G to the front. Uh, for, this isn't the first time he's accused me of raping him. So he said even that first time it was non-consensual. That tells me a whole heck of a lot. Um, also, considering the culture of the world on top of a very conservative culture, religious, uh, he probably felt guilt of the fact that it was physically possible because he had been aroused. That's a physiological response, but he probably felt that he was somehow complicit. Even if he didn't want this to happen, his body, in a sense, betrayed him and it happened. And then he probably felt guilt and felt like it could not have been great because that's not possible for your man. In fact, years later, she went on and on and on. And we'll see some of that where she said it's not possible for a woman to do that to a man. So he feels very guilty. He goes straight to his bishop to confess and breaks up with her. Now, according to his timetable, they were only together for a few weeks. But she is not done with him. She refuses to be done. And so uh, we have got, of course, he said, she said situation. And in the documentary, she specifically says they were just dating and had this beautiful night together. It was so romantic. And then he vanished into thin air. That's how she put it. Vanished into thin air. He went on his mission. Months after this, so, it, that, and I'll get into some of that in a minute as to what that actually means and how he could not have vanished into thin air. But after the breakup, this is Kirk, his words. He says, a few days later, I was riding home on a motorcycle because the tires of my car had been slashed. Classy, Joyce. McKinney, Joyce, pulled up beside me in a car and tried to stop me. I drove off the road. And managed to ride home where she made me, made toward me screaming and kicking. She was very upset that I wouldn't go to a party. So, yeah, she would not leave him alone. She There were reports of her assaulting him on top of slashing his tires. And so he fled to California to try to avoid her and then to Oregon where he was living temporarily under an assumed name. Like, he's trying to escape this crazy woman who attacked him. She can't find him right away, at least. She has the worst of her emotional breakdowns. And uh, it sounds like she, like after Wayne got engaged and after she lost to Miss USA and, and some of these other events that she would be just distraught and would end up being in the hospital in Provo, the regular hospital, which was then just, I think it was Utah Valley Hospital today. It's Utah Valley Regional Medical Center. It's a much larger hospital. This time she was actually sent to a different hospital, also in Provo, although um, when it was first built, it was away from any residents. 
It was several blocks away on the southeast end of the city, kind of away from everything. It was the state mental hospital. And it was gorgeous. I didn't know how pretty it used to be. And how sad that, uh, yeah, they raised it and rebuilt some ugly buildings. So I'll post some of those. It just makes me so sad. Some of the buildings were demolished in 81. Sounds like the bulk of the campus. And then some of the smaller, prettier buildings that had been built in the 1900s. Um, they weren't demolished until about 20 years later, but they're, all the pretty buildings are gone. Um, from 1971 to 1997, the patients would put on annually a haunted house for the public. It started out as a Halloween party just for themselves, and then it morphed into a public haunted house and they raised a lot of money for the hospital, which was great, but the patients ran it. And I attended it one time. I believe this was Halloween of either 87 or 88. And it freaked the crap out of me. Um, I was there with a friend whose mother worked at the hospital. And she assured me that, oh, these are, these are patients who have proven themselves and are, have really good behavior. And I'm like, that doesn't make me feel any better. <laughs> so. Anyway, in 1997, like uh, the National Institute, National Institute of Health or Mental Health, something, some organization said this is not helping stigma there, and they shut it, she shut it down. Joyce was there uh, during this era, and uh, she escaped out of a window um, and went on to try to rescue Kirk from the Mormons. So here's the thing, though. So when she says that he vanished into thin air, let's talk about what it means to go on a mission and how this works. And if she had been in the culture for any amount of time, which she was for probably at least a year, if not longer, uh, she would have known at least part of this. She would have known that uh, at the time, young men serving missions, then at 19, so young men typically would go to a, maybe a year of college and then they'd go on their missions. But it's a process. They call it putting in your papers for a reason. There are a lot of papers, a lot of paperwork to do. You have to uh, go get physicals, tests to make sure that you're physically in, in shape to be able to do a mission. You have to go to a dentist and get any dental work done, including getting your wisdom teeth out if you haven't yet. You need or orthodontic work if that's necessary, vaccinations and on and on and on. If there's any health issues, addressing them before they're officially papers are put in. You have to go through interviews with uh, your bishop, which is your congregation leader, your stake president. And he, a, a stake is a, a group of congregations. Uh, so it's a larger geographical area. And then you have to wait for your doctor, your dentist, your bishop, your stake president. Everybody has their own papers they're supposed to fill out and send in to headquarters. All of that has to be gathered together. And then you're waiting on the Salt Lake mission department and their their timing and when they sit down and, and assign calls and then back then it was by snail mail and if you were in utah you we, everybody knew what day they were uh mailed you'd be like okay my call is coming this week it'll be in the in the mailbox on wednesday and it was a this famous white envelope and family and friends and roommates would gather together and open the call together. And you can still see these videos. You can go on Facebook or wherever. There's tons of videos of missionaries opening their calls. Nowadays it's via email, but they'll still gather around this young person opening their call on their phone. Anyway, but it takes weeks, if not months, to get your papers in. There's no way he just vanished into thin air on a mission. That, not how it works. Not remotely. And she would have known at the very least, maybe not the all of what it takes to put in your papers, but she would have known the tradition of opening, I'll put it in my papers, it's official, now we're waiting, and now the call came, and now, you know, she would have known that his call was coming at the bare minimum, if he was still in Utah at least, or that you know he didn't, the, the Mormons didn't just take him and hide him somewhere, which is what she implied, which is ridiculous. Um, and then on top of that, before the missionary leaves, there's all the shopping to do with your suits and your luggage and your if getting extra vaccinations if you need those if you're going to some third world place or missionary also has to write a letter to accept the call. And then anyway, there's so many other things. 
then the missionary, when they do report, it's, it would be at the, the missionary training center, the MTC in Provo, which is basically on BYU campus on one end of it. Back then, it had very lax security. People could walk in and say, I have cookies. Who wants one? And nowadays, there is security. You couldn't have done that. But if she knew when he was at the MTC, she could have caused problems harassing and stalking him there as well. So I don't know when he got the call exactly. If he sent in his papers from Oregon or California when he was hiding out from her, don't know, of course, any of that. Uh, but if he was kind of in hiding, there's a very good chance. And he wasn't living in California or Oregon very long. So chances are it was his, his regular bishop from home and his stake president from home that would have been sending in the papers. One thing we, uh, we do know from Delaney, D Delano, Delano, Anthony's book is that Kirk was initially called to serve in California. Which explains why Joyce booked it to California. She dropped her PhD studies at BYU. No idea if she officially dropped out or even if she left mid-semester and just left her class and students hanging. So I do wonder if that was after he got the call, maybe even after he'd been at the MTC. He would have been there for a month. Back then, uh, if you were English speaking, that was your native language. You were there for a month. If you were foreign language, then you would be there for two months to help learn the language of wherever you were going. And so if she knew he was called to California, then, then she probably booked it to California to try to find him. And so we do know he was first called to California and then eventually he was reassigned to, to England. So when that reassignment happened, I don't know. I suspect he was either in the MTC or in California and had served a little bit of his mission. And he and his leaders both realized, we need to get the heck away from Joyce. We just do. And this is not working. <laughs> so let's reassign him. And since he didn't go foreign speaking, let's keep him English speaking. And let's ship him across the ocean. So England makes sense. Today, there are MTCs in other places, inc including there's one in England. Uh, but that one didn't open until 1985, so he would have gone to the one in Provo because that was the only one at the time. While she's in California, she says that she was excommunicated and got mad about it. It does, makes absolutely no sense because she said the church is after her because she's trying to escape but they won't let her. So make up your mind. Um, and the church has actually said, at the time, said no, she has not been excommunicated. Nowadays, they won't comment on anyone's membership status, but they said no at the time. No, she has not been excommunicated. She made that up. Um, however, she's doing plenty of things that could get her excommunicated. She is supporting herself as a sex worker. She had ads that she would put into newspapers advertising BDSM and uh, all kinds of fantasy things and the gamut. Uh, she was known to do, quote unquote, everything but the main thing. She had a friend that she, or an associate that she hired to do that part. But she would literally do everything else, and there's a lot of everything else. So that alone, uh, between being that, that being a felony um, in California, as well as just those acts themselves, both of those would have been enough to get her excommunicated, but she wasn't yet. While she's in California, she meets up with this couple who... Is a, is a mission for themselves. Uh, they're trying to save people who have gone into splinter Christian groups and try to bring them back, whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses, Latter-day Saints. And there's a, a list of them, I guess. And I personally think from everything that I've read uh, that she took, I took their idea of these offshoots as cults. That's where she first got the idea that Latter-day Saints were a cult. That's my opinion. She was asking them for help to rescue him. She hooks up with this guy named Steve. And he fall, completely falls for her, as a lot of people do. She has this way of getting people to trust her and fall for her and whatever. At one point, she even said, everyone falls in love with me. Like, oh my goodness, I hate it when that happens. Okay, whatever. But Steve was kind of her friend even though he was hoping for more. At one point, they drove back to Utah, 
uh, to get a lot of her stuff that she'd left. Um, as well as, they, it sounds like they wanted to, this cracks me up, hack into the church computer. Uh, as, as if there was one. And of course, this is way before like the internet was big or there was like anything like that. So, huh? Whatever. But on the way there, they uh, get into an accident. Steve falls asleep at the wheel and the car flips and she is ejected. Doesn't get hurt terribly bad, but she does get some kind of injury uh, that hurts her and she leaves a scar either on her cheek or on her neck. And for the rest of her life, then she kind of kept her hair kind of covered, covering that spot. Even her mugshot we see later, you don't really see that part of her skin. She claimed when people would ask, where did that scar come from? She would say, some Mormon thugs did it to me. And Steve goes, no, that, that, that was the car accident. <laughs> she decided to use uh, some names that she found at the Family History Library to go toward her fake documents. She had lots of fake uh, documents, ide identities aliases over the years and uh it's funny because people are like oh it was the church that enabled it i'm like the family history library has so much history it's like genealogists from all across the world fly and come into salt lake to go to the family history library and look at microfiche themselves this was not something exclusive to members this and it's not nefarious either it's just it's genealogy records Go for it. And Anthony kind of makes it sound, again, a bit different. Um, he also makes it sound like uh, proxy work is only something that people only do for their direct ancestors, which, again, is, is, is not the case. That's Anyway, there's so many things wrong in his book about the church. It just is it's laughable and painful at the same time. She hired a PI in Utah to bug his parents' home, which is completely illegal. Utah is a one-party state. Which means that you can have a conversation and record it as long as one of the two people know it's being recorded. That's not what this was. This wasn't a PI talking to Kirk's mother or father. This was him bugging their house and listening to entire conversations. Completely illegal. But it was thanks to that that uh, they were able to find out that Kirk was in England. She decides to go rescue Kirk in England. But she can't do it herself. After all, she's quite small, despite saying that she is five foot seven, because that sounds good as a model. People say, no, she was shorter than that, which one more lie. Let's, you know, let's just add one more to the, to the pile. So let me read the, her uh, newspaper ad that she placed. All caps. It starts out with free trip to Europe. And then parentheses, a big adventurous dude wanted. Must be white male, over six foot two, at least 210 pounds, seeking a Rocky or Mr. Atlas type. Prefer bodybuilder or musician. Explain that one to me. I honestly, if you're looking for muscle, why, why a musician? Like, it's someone who, who maybe plays like a stand up bass rather than like an electrical bass, then maybe they have muscle. How would a musician be useful for her? For her? I, I don't understand. I, I, I just, I don't. Her ad says, all expenses paid if you help a lovely fox fulfill a unique romantic fantasy as part of her wedding party. Must be available August and September. Serious replies only. Leave a message for Heidi at, and then she leaves the phone number. She's also looking for a pilot. She thinks it would be awesome to have someone who flies them around. And so this man named Gil applies and he sort of has had some pilot training, but he lost his license because he was drinking while flying. But he's also like a bodybuilder. Uh, he actually was the one who put up the ad for her at a gym and then said, well, hey, I could do it. And she's like, sure, I hired. And we had Jackson Shaw also apply. Now he's not a big bodybuilder dude, uh, but he is an actual pilot. And so he responds to the pilot ad and meets Keith, who is Joyce's, like, she calls him a brother figure. But Keith was someone else who completely fell for her and was hoping she would fall in love with him. And, of course, she never did. We find out later in England uh, that they were doing all kinds of things physically together, except for, you know, the everything but thing as well, because she was trying to save that for, for Kirk. 
Okay. She calls him KJ because says he was Keith Joseph. So I might go KJ or Keith. Same guy. So the pilot, Jackson, comes to this apartment where he meets Keith. And he has doesn't know what to expect. But then a few minutes later, Joyce walks in. And she is wearing a see-through blouse, completely see-through, and no bra. Jackson's intrigued. <laughs> and he says, I'm trying to figure out here if she and Keith are like an item, and if I can ask her out. Now, they didn't show the ad for the pilot, but if it's anything like the other one, it sounds like it did mention the whole wedding party thing. So... He was later surprised that she had lied to him. We'll get into that again. But why was he surprised if he, she was clearly not getting married and or he was hoping to ask her out, thinking she was going to get married? I mean, none of this is making sense to me. I didn't. But yes, he's like, oh, she's attractive. But he didn't wonder how she was good for the money for hiring a that's expensive. When she hired him once to fly them down to San Diego for dinner from the Los Angeles area, he rented out the most expensive small plane to see if she could pay for it. And instead of renting it with a credit card, which would be normal, uh, she didn't have a credit card. But she pulled out a whole bunch of hundred dollar bills. And again, keeping in mind, this is 70s and a hundred dollars went a whole lot farther back then so mm -hmm. anyway so he's like well okay so he's shocked because she had said she's a model and he's like i don't know how much models make i don't think it's that much eventually apparently there was even a time they went to a new beach together and that almost sounds like it was a planned thing for her to be like oh my goodness people are watching me and taking pictures i don't know but that's the story that jackson tells in the documentary if you want to watch that so we have four people who then head off to England. Joyce herself, and then we have Keith, and then we have Jackson, the pilot, and then we have Gil, the bodybuilder. Before this, however, when she finds out he, that Kirk is in England on his mission, and he's been, there, he's been on his mission for about a year, she had hired a pr private investigator in England who had found Kirk and had sent her places where he might be. She has places to look when she gets to England. They arrive at Heathrow in August 5th, and Keith and Joyce, at least, are there under assumed names with false passports. Uh, Keith is going by Paul Van Dusen, and Joyce is Kathy Von Baer, B-A-R-E, which I thought was, I wonder if she thought that was a fun name because she liked nude beaches and whatever else. And also in her, the, the work she was doing in California, she did a lot of posing in places and ways and and stuff that are not family friendly. Let's put it that way. So having Bear as her last name is that that that's appropriate. We are gonna stop there for part one. You will definitely want to stick around and listen to part two because that's where a lot of the crazy happens. That's where we get disguises and kidnappings and all of the crazy court stuff. Be sure to tune in to part two.